Okay, so if you're going to teach momentum or learn about momentum, it's a really good idea to be very familiar with Newton's three laws of motion. Okay, so uh, let's see if we can apply Newton's three laws of motion to this image here. Okay, so we've got a picture of the Earth and the Moon, and they seem to be falling towards each other. These black lines are just reference, reference lines. Right, so the first law states that velocity remains constant unless unbalanced forces are acting. So we can say that since these things appear to be accelerating and there's a change in velocity, therefore unbalanced forces must be acting. So that's applying the first law. Right, the second law states that force is proportional to mass times acceleration. So if you keep the mass the same, increasing the force will increase acceleration. If you change the mass and you keep the force the same, then um, making the mass bigger will make the acceleration smaller. Right? So I can't really apply the second law without also applying the third law. The third law states that um, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So the moon is pulling on the earth and the earth is pulling on the moon with an equal and opposite force, right? in an opposite direction basically. So that's the third law applied. Let's do the second law now. The mass of the moon is very small. The force is the same as the force on the earth, but uh, a small mass with a force on it and a big mass with a force on it will experience different accelerations because of the second law. So the moon is accelerating to a greater extent than the, moon, the earth is. Okay, so if you're happy with that and that's, you're comfortable with that, it's time to look at the concept of momentum. Okay, so this is the comic. Somewhere in deep space, a red rocket is about to hit a blue one. So from our perspective, basically, the blue rocket is stationary. This thing is moving at a constant um, velocity. They smash into each other, and then they both fly off together. Right? Um, we can apply Newton's laws of motion to this. So in the first instance, you can say the first law, basically, that um, the objects will remain at a constant velocity unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Um, during the collision, you can say there's definitely going to be an unbalanced force acting because this object's definitely going to accelerate. And actually, maybe you could imagine this object would be decelerating, so there's unbalanced forces acting on both of them. Right? So um, when these forces are applied, you'll get equal and opposite forces. So the red object pushes on the blue object with a force. The blue object pushes on the red object with a force. Okay, They're equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. Um, you could say that the size of the force depends on the mass and the acceleration. In this case, we know the sizes of the forces are the same. Um, so you could say that the acceleration depends on the mass, or in, inversely depends on the mass. Okay. After the collision, we're back to law one. The object, this time it's the combined object, will remain at constant velocity unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Okay, so now we want to describe this algebraically, right? We can say that the red force is equal to the blue force, but the negative blue force, because the blue force is acting in the opposite direction. It's a vector quantity, and to show that the direction is opposite, we're using the minus sign. Okay, so since force is equal to mass times acceleration, which is Newton's second law, we could also express this uh, like this. We're simply substituting mass times acceleration for force on both sides. Now, you've got a you recognize that acceleration is, equal to, is also equal to change in velocity over time. So you can substitute change in velocity over time for A in both cases. Um, so basically this formula, this formula, this formula are identical. Now, the time that each object are touching each other is going to be exactly the same. right? Um, so if this was two seconds, for instance, and two seconds, you could multiply both sides of the equation by 2. Or you can just simply cancel out the t's and, and it disappears from both sides of the equation. So we can express it like this. Now, this is basically it. We're, we're saying that mass times change of velocity is the same in magnitude for both objects. right? Um, so the changes are equal in magnitude, but they're opposite in direction. Now, it says here, what I wrote earlier, that uh, mass times change in velocity stay the same. We call mass times velocity momentum. Okay, that's the definition of momentum: mass times velocity. It's actually a vector quantity, and you could also draw it as arrows and add it up in such ways. Um, but essentially, it's pretty straightforward math. But just to make it clearer, we can we can say now that during collisions, momentum is conserved; uh, it's not lost. To make it clear, I'm going to use an example from the physics classroom website. Changed it to pounds, not dollars. Okay, so if uh, the red person 
gives the blue person 50 pounds then the red guy or red person has had a negative change of 50 the blue person's had a positive change of 50 they're equal in magnitude but they're opposite in direction the total amount of money though has remained constant at 200 pounds right so you can think of this with momentum right if the change in magnitude was identical for each object but the directions were opposite then it means that the total amount of momentum was also constant so you can apply that to a question so uh, this is an example question it's a good idea to pause the video now and read it properly hopefully you've done that so this is my um, a suggestion for how a student should go about solving it and I'll show afterwards what it will look like as a final answer okay so first I'd say whenever you read a question in physics it's a great idea to sketch a diagram and add any information you can to it. In this case, it's a good idea to do a before and an after picture. Okay, before the collision, after the collision. Skipping step two in our original cartoon. Okay, now I'm adding all the details from the question. So 1,000, 1,200 uh, kilograms, the masses of the two spacecraft. When they combine, it becomes 2,200 because it's basically like one object now. Um, this wasn't moving. This was moving. The directions are given with these arrows as well. I'm going to guess at the direction of this that it's going to move in that, that direction, although I might not know necessarily. Okay. Then you can write beneath this the uh, conservation of momentum statement. Okay. So total momentum before equals total momentum after. The next step, then step three, will be to um, ask yourself how many momentums you have either side or sorry before and after. Right. Because there are two separate objects before and they combine after. I've got two momentums to consider before and one momentum to consider after and that's what is shown here. I've just uh, used letters to represent mass and uh, velocity for each of the objects. I've also put a subscript in so little r is representing the red object, little b is representing the blue object and rb is representing the uh, combined object at the end. It just makes things, if you set it all out neat and you label things clearly you don't get lost, you don't make silly mistakes people can follow what you've done as well which is a real bonus when you're marking people's work okay so uh, now we can substitute the numbers into the equation and simplify so the mass of the red was 1000 it was doing 10 meters per second this was 1200 it was doing zero um, we don't know the final velocity that's why it's just been left as the letter but we do know its mass was 2200 kilograms right so we can simplify we can see that the 12,000 times zero is equal to zero so that cancels it just doesn't means nothing zero times something is nothing um, now we need to rearrange for VRB divide both sides by 220 means that 220 on this side will cancel the 220 here and 10,000 divided by 220 hundred will give us 4.5 meters per second so that's your final answer um, <coughs> okay so let's see what a really well set out answer would look like from a student okay they'll have drawn a diagram probably hopefully make it a lot easier for them and then if they set it out like this so that um, each line of the calculation is beneath the other the total momentum before is beneath the picture for total um, for the before picture the momentum after is beneath the picture for the momentum after picture it just means that as they're working through this conceptually they don't get lost they don't get mixed up with the numbers and start sticking them in the wrong places if you get students who are calculator heroes, they'll try and stick all the numbers in the calculator and then have an answer and they'll hold the calculator up to you. Is it 4.5? But you know they cannot repeat this uh, under pressure or certainly when they're a bit tired or have maybe forgotten a bit of this information. So uh, getting them to set it out line by line like this just means that they can cope when uh, the pressure's on. And I personally as well. I can't do these types of questions unless, especially when I'm tired towards the end of the day, there's no way I can solve these types of problems uh, in my head or on a calculator without being sure that I haven't made a mistake. Okay, so if you found this useful, please comment. If you've got any uh, suggestions for improvements, also I'd be happy to hear them. Thanks for watching.